And um, I'm going to begin with a little sermon. And here, here are the ground rules on it. Okay? Um, the rules are I want you to fill it out anonymously. And uh, I hope you don't this, but be honest. Okay, so this is a survey about truth. So, question number one these are all, it's circle, scale one to ten, there's no short answer, it's easy. Um, don't answer how you think you should answer in church, answer what you really think. You know what I mean? So question number one says, do you believe truth exists? If you're wrestling with that, don't put 10 because you're in church. Well, I've got to put 10 because I've got to put 1. It's going to be anonymous. And there, there's, a, there's a reason for this. There's a method behind the madness. And I'm going to talk about it because I pass these out. Uh, I made more than enough copies. I made like a lot of copies. Um, so that I'm going to just pass out chunks of them. And uh, some of you have pens because you have purses. Um, and then there's a method. So I'm passing out pens. Um, your pencil is fine, but do not put your name on it. And um, there are, well, I was going to say there's no wrong answers, there actually are wrong answers, but, but these are not graded, let me put it that way. And I want everyone to fill it out, I don't care your age. If you can read, you should fill it out, and well, I should probably, no, they're right there, but pens. Um, did somebody say open note? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's open note, you're free to use whatever resources you want. And, um, I have to get the screw up the badass here. And there we go. I'll pass out more pens. We're going to talk. Um, pens? Okay. Pens. Okay, just pass them back and share pens. Um, we're going to spend some time talking over the next few weeks about truth. And I'm not starting the sermon yet because I want you to focus on that. Um, but what I'm doing is um, the reason I'm giving up the survey, I'll tell you the, the kind of method behind the mask. And by the way, for those watching on the internet, I am going to email this out because I actually have a couple people who saw my email earlier this week. They contacted me and said, is the sermon going to be online? So for those watching online, I can send out the survey because I, I do, I, I really want people's feedback and opinion. I don't care if you've been here once or a hundred times, um, please just fill it out, you know what I mean? Um, this is based on a class I took this, this summer at Bethel Seminary in St. Paul. Um, the class was called Missional Apologetics, which is a fancy way of saying sharing your faith or speaking about the faith in a missional setting. It's a recognition that one of the things that we Christians have gotten wrong over the last maybe 30, 40 years is we don't recognize the word mission field. Uh, we are a mission field, and people don't speak the church language a lot of us speak. I'm going to get into more of this in a second. But this class was unpacking how, in relationship and conversation, we might actually kind of unpack this. And we're going to talk about that over the next four or five weeks, um, so the next four weeks. Um, I'm going to talk today about truth. But I want to get your thoughts on it. And then what I'm going to do is at the end of the series, I'm going to pass out the same survey, but the back is going to have some short answers as well to challenge you to think, how do we, we're going to talk about this, so you know, don't get too riled up yet. How do we do a better job of reaching the community, not with the, with, with the, you know, the information about Beachside, because that's not really our calling. Our calling is to reach the community with the love of Christ. So how do we do a better job of that? And my goal, I'm going to tell you my, my end goal for the sermon series, my goal is for you to be empowered to share what you believe. And I'll, I'll talk more about why that is in just a moment. If in a church, the only person who does ministry is the highly paid professionals up front, we're in huge trouble. If you say, well, you know, we paid our student Chris to do like ministry, and we sit back and we watch, and it was it was interesting, I was at um, and I'll say more about his talk later on, but I was I was at the Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ um, annual gathering um, last week, beginning of the week, and we had a gentleman named Ed Stetzer come and speak. He is the president, he has a lot of things, but one of his hats is he's the president of Lifeway, which is the Southern Baptist um, Publishing wing, which, by the way, if you think this whole community church thing like Lutherans and Baptists and Pentecostals and whatever all hanging out together, if you think it's a local thing, it's not. It is what is going on. We have realized that we have enough barriers between us that maybe, just maybe, Lutherans can learn from Baptists and Baptists can learn from Lutherans and Presbyterians can learn from Baptists. And so one of our keynote speakers at a Lutheran denominational gathering was a Southern Baptist minister. And he talked about that whole concept of engaging our neighbors with the truth. He did an excellent job. I'll say more about that in a second. Um, when you're done, 
I want you just to let's pass them down maybe to the end of the aisle. And um, Ray and Andrew, would you guys, no, I'm sorry, um, Ray and Andrew, or, or Rusty, you know, if you guys would just collect the surveys, because I'm going to launch a sermon. Uh, but don't overthink them, just pass them down maybe to your left. And then Ray and Andrew can just come and collect them. And uh, like I said, please do not put your names on You're welcome to. But I want them to be announced. So I want to really um, get your thoughts on this. And then what I'm going to do is I want to put the numbers together and see where we're at. And then, you know, maybe look at after the sermon series where we're at, see if there's any shift. I want to even talking about truth because truth is really, it's part of our language. And you need to speak the language if you're going to share something. Whether it's your faith, or your choice of automobile, or your beliefs about sports, or whatever it is, we all know we have to speak the same language. I mean, that, that's common sense. When I was in Korea in August, I, I, I saw that a lot of the churches have these big red crosses on them. And not the red cross like the, um, I forget there's a name for that kind of cross, but the four, the, the, the equal sign. It, it, they're regular crosses like they have in churches, but they're the color red. And they were all over the churches. And in doing some research, I found out that it was a symbol of indigenous Korean Christianity. And it's interesting because South Korea has been way more open to the gospel than countries like Japan or China. And the connection I'm making is that it was locals spreading the faith. It wasn't missionaries coming from America saying, hey, we're here to tell you Koreans about this guy Jesus who lived in uh, what is you know, uh, we call Israel. Um, it was Koreans telling the neighbors in their language, in their culture, in, in their social settings, about what it is they believed. And the gospel spread like wildfire bread. Um, under Western missionaries, it has not in Japan, and it did not in China, although China, now you know, a communist country, and the missionaries have really not been there since 1948, Christianity's booming. It's, it's interesting. And so there's something about knowing the language and speaking a language, and we Christians have missed the boldness because we have failed to see that our culture has moved on. Stetzer was talking about the fact that if you look at worship attendance as a percentage of population, it's about the same now as it was in the late 40s. You think, well, that can't be true. People aren't going to church, and nobody goes to church. Well, that, that's actually statistically not true. It's ebbed and flowed. There have been times where it's been higher. There have been times where it's been lower. But overall, worship attendance in 2016 is about, as a percentage of population, exactly what it was in the late 40s. The difference is, the unchurched, those not going to church, really don't go to church. And they really don't speak our language. There's a funny video that um, Eric and Jill, and, and Jill, I think, is back in the street. Eric's just walking. Everybody look at Eric. Everybody look at him. Uh, I was just, I was just talking to him. Eric went to the church, I, you know, like, you know, so I pastor in Iowa. And do you remember the video? I don't know if you were there yet. Um, Mr. Christianese speaking man. It was like a takeoff of the Bud commercials. And or, you remember the Bud commercials? Like, here's to you, Mr. I forget what the, what the commercial was about, but here's to you, Mr. Whatever. Well, there was a takeoff of that in like 03, 02, and I showed up during a sermon. And the video makes light of the different terms we use within Christian circles, and we assume everybody knows what they mean. And even those terms 15 years ago, I realized, I don't think even most Christians know those terms anymore. Um, in the video, they drop an eschatology. And if you if you know what that term means, you're among a, a very small percentage of, yeah, but, but some of you are shaking your head like, I have no clue what eschatology means. It means the study of the end. Eschatos is a Greek word for the end. And so we've got all these words we use, and um, and then we, we invite our neighbors to worship, and we wonder why they don't come. And so I want us to model the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 16, um, and, and Mike will follow along on the screen. This is verses 16 and 23 in the New Living Translation. You've got the Apostle Paul in the town of Athens. And so you've got to remember that as he is speaking to people about Jesus, this is a pagan town. And by pagan, I mean literally, that was the religion. It was a, you know, the Greco Roman religions were the predominant religions. There were basically no Christians. The first uh, person baptized in Europe was a woman named Lydia in a town called Philippi, just up the road from, from uh, Athens. I've been to Philippi, and they have actually the, the river itself, the river Lydia. They have, you can, there's a baptistry there where you can go in and be baptized, where she was baptized. It's the first European baptism. So this is early on. It says this, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Now I'm going to pause there. And I'm not asking for show of hands, I'm asking for amens, I'm asking for nods. But I know, in conversation, 
I know in Facebook, I know in a lot of different settings, many of you are deeply troubled by what you see going on in our culture. Okay? There are some that say, I don't know what's going on, it's freaky. Things are changing and they're changing fast. I don't get it. Well, Paul was there, except he had never been in Christian culture. He was walking around going, Man, these people worship statues and their morals and their, their ethos and their culture. This place is bad news. And so then we see in verse 17, Paul ripped that nose down and he pointed his finger at the thing. No, that's not what he did, is it? It says in verse 17, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God for the Gentiles. He spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching on some foreign gods. And I'll pause there for a second. If, if you want to be an army chaplain, th th this feels really familiar. This feels really familiar. You know, because you're you're this you're this religious person in the midst of a largely a-religious culture. Um, the, the, the JAG is my traveling buddy. I was on army duty yesterday, and we were laughing about a story. It's not funny, but it is. Um, he was telling me about a year and a half ago, he was at an event um, where we collect all social information, make sure we have up to date information about their, you know, home of record, the next of kin, things like that. One of the things we survey is our religion. So if a Catholic soldier, for example, is killed in combat, we know to call a priest and do the last rites and all that stuff. And some of the soldiers decided it'd be fun to mess with the chaplain, which it is. And they apparently told their chaplain their religion was they worshipped Odin. And so we have a bunch of soldiers, a bunch of infantry soldiers over in Tampa whose state religion is like Nordic religions. Because we're, we're, you know, our job is not to say, well, that's not what you really believe, just messing with me. But they had some fun. And, and, and so, you know, it really hasn't changed that much. And so they're laughing at Paul, who's a fool, babbling about some guy who died, gross from the dead, worshiping foreign gods. It says, then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, he said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, this is um, Luke's parenthetical mark, should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. This was like New York or LA. Who would like to hear this new religious fact? Come and talk to us. Let's go hang out with the, with, with the city council. Let's, let's talk. So Paul, <coughs> standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. You see that? Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. Does he agree with the pagan idols? No. Does he worship pagan idols? No. Is it forbidden for Christians to worship pagan idols? Yes. But he says, you know what? I, I, I can tell you are a very religious people. And he says um, in verse um, 25, 23, For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God, this God whom you, this is Paul speaking, this God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm talking about. So he takes this, this sliver of, of, of commonality and says, you know, you've got, a, you've got an altar to an unknown God. Let me tell you about the unknown God. And now in verse 24 he says, He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. Um, he gives himself life and breath to everything. He satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. I'm going longer than I've got on the screen. Okay, I'll just finish this part. I, I will read the whole chapter, actually. If you guys don't interrupt me, I realize I can read past what I put up on the screen. Um, he decided beforehand when this should rise and fall in the eternal wars. And Paul goes on throughout um, that chapter to explain the gospel to people using a common language and a common point of reference. Now, where I want to challenge us as we, as we talk uh, over the next few weeks about truth is to unpack and to figure out the language in our culture. Some of you speak better than I do. Some of you speak worse than I do. But we all have some learning to do. You know, my, my eyes were open in some ways at uh, uh, train, uh, the, Trey's teaching, but Kat, Trey and Kathy's wedding. Um, I can't tell you how many people at the reception afterwards said, Gosh, we've heard so much about Beachside. In fact, if everybody had told me they had heard about Beachside was coming to Beachside, we'd have like 30 more people in the building. I mean, it was amazing. 
I don't love you. Like, oh yeah, I invited my next door neighbor. They're not coming right now, but I told them I'll be inside, and we're all going around telling neighbors, because you know, here, here's the deal. Here's the secret. We got a really good thing going. Amen? Like, I don't know about you, but I, I leave here, and I have to listen to myself. I leave here on Sunday and feeling like, this, this is a good group of people, and we're worshiping God, and we're getting humble before him, and he's doing things, and we're, we're serving the community. Um, you know, I, I told you know, people in Denver, they asked, well, how's Beachside going? And I said, it's going great. We're a small, poor church. You know, we have no money, we know, we're, we're, but, but it's going great. I mean, you know, we, 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 I tell them about Wayne and the, the way some of you have kind of adopted him and talk about the beach clamps and beach services, and God's doing some amazing things, and you're excited about Beachside. And I don't know what, you know, your thing may be the worship, that maybe the preaching, maybe the friendship, that maybe the casual nature. By the way, if you have a problem with, with a pastor wearing jeans, well, you're probably not here as it is. I, you know, um, get used to it. I do it sometimes. I don't think anybody is really a, truly a first-time visitor. Um, but but that's just, it's who we are. Right? It's not better or worse. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the church where you wear a suit and a tie. It's just not, uh, apparently if you're here, it's not you. You know, you've got a good thing going. And people are inviting people to church, but they're not coming. And I realize after taking this class, after listening to Stetzer speak, and this is where I'm kind of tying them all together, he talked about the fact that our job is not to invite people to church. Our job is to disciple people with the love of Jesus Christ. I've been doing it wrong for 20 years. Because, you know, we have campaigns to invite people to church. Let's get people to church. We'll advertise. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll have this event. And I, I've been doing it that way since at least the late 90s when I interned and and a church across. We were a big church, so we had a big building, and we had big events. Lots of people came. And I don't think we were considered that the percentage of people at the state was probably really low. But when you have a musical concert like Jammer for Jesus, we'd have like about 1,500, 2,000 people sitting and listening to music, eating walking tacos. We have bounce houses for the kids. You don't realize, well, of the whatever percent that don't go to our church, only 1% of them came back. It's easy with big numbers to see that, that maybe, maybe that's not working. And what Stats has suggested is what we need to do is not difficult. We need to love and disciple and get to know and speak to our neighbors. And then, after telling them about the love of Christ, you extend the invitation of worship. Now, I'm not saying don't invite neighbors. You should. Okay? I'm not, I'm not changing. I still think we should do that. But it was revolutionary for me. And so the reason inviting people to church doesn't work real well is because it assumes a lot that isn't real in their lives. For example, we assume that people who are inviting believe in God. And, and, and I mean believe now in acknowledge the existence of. They may not. The percentage of Americans that don't believe in any God is still really low. But we're making assumptions about neighbors that they believe that God exists. And then we assume that the person has actual faith. There are lots of people out there that will tell me, especially in the army, I believe God exists and I hate him. I've heard that. I'm angry. Why did he take my mom when I was eight years old? If he exists, I don't want a part of him. If he exists, I'm angry at him. If he exists, I think he's mean and judgmental and his people suck. Can I say that? I think I just did. <laughs> I raised this coming out like, that's not church word, you don't get it back, but I said it. You know, because that's what people say about us. Well, I believe there's a God. I want nothing to do with that God business. So we assume when we invite you to the beach side. We got a really good music. Chris would like to if I need more coffee, which I don't. You know, we assume that the people actually have faith in God and want to know more about God. We assume that they have a felt need to go to church. You're here, I hope, because you find some kind of value. In being here. And it's interesting when I talk to people, you know, here at Beach, I'm like, why do you come? I tell I love the people. It's my time to worship God. I humble myself before God. I need to hear somebody else teaching. You know, for me as a preacher, one of the worst things about being a preacher is you, you have to listen to yourself. And I make light of that, but I'm serious about that. It's refreshing to go somewhere else, like when I went to this conference. It's refreshing to go and have somebody else speak. It's refreshing to go. One of the reasons I'm pursuing my doctor is not because I want a doctor in front of my name, but I need people that know more than I do to tell me stuff. Because there's a lot I have to learn. 
That's why hopefully many of you are here is we got to talk about this God stuff and, and grow deeper in it. But when we invite people out to church, guess what? They probably don't have a felt need to be in church, otherwise they would be in church. And our goal is not for you to invite your neighbors to go to a different church. That really is our goal. Our goal is to invite people not come to church. And then we assume that beach settle will meet those needs. And the reality is, even if you're a believer, we're not the right church for everybody. Some people want a traditional church with Pastor Rose Robes and we have no one sing hymns. Not us. Other people say, I really want a church with, with special lighting effects. I'm not making a light of it. I mean, we, we do contemporary music, and I think we do it well, but it's, 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 it's within a certain genre. We don't do the rock band with, with, with everybody up here, at least Rusty and I are not hopelessly cool. We, we passed about 15, 20 years ago, that ship sailed, you know. But I mean, there's some churches, and I love them, and, I, and I'm not making light of them, but there's some churches where everybody up there is hopelessly cool. The music is like cutting edge rock and roll. The lights go with the beat of the music for people like me that have trouble clapping. It's awesome. It's not us. And that's not bad, it's just different. And so if somebody comes and says, I want that, I'll say, well, that's not really us. If somebody comes and says, I really wish you were a robot, I'm like, I'm wearing jeans. It's not gonna happen, this is not the right, this, 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 is, this isn't really what you want. If, if that's a deal breaker. You know, for, for most of us, not a deal breaker. I know some people say, well, I wish you were a robot. But I like to preach, you know. Uh, but for some people, that's, that's a deal breaker. And so, our call then is to speak the gospel then, not to speak B side. I hope you do that at some point. But our, our, our call is to love our neighbors. And we really need that right now. We're in a time where people are mad. I don't, I don't even want to say the word politics now because it's like, it's like, it's okay, yeah, I feel dirty even saying it. I don't care who you're voting for, you're probably mad. You know? And I, I'm going to say all candidates, but. Donald Trump is the devil, Hillary Clinton is the devil, Gary Johnson is the devil, or at least he doesn't know where level is, or something, you know? And you can go down the list, and, and you've got your reasons for, I hate them, I hate what they stand for, and they're going to destroy our country. And here's the thing, guys. I don't know, I don't know, candidate A or B may or may not destroy the country, but I know is, I'm going to die someday, and Jesus is going to ask me about voting record. I am really sure of that. But he's going to ask me, did you love your neighbor? Did you tell them about me? Did you care about them? That's what matters. The rest of it, there are probably better choices than not. I'm not going to tell you what I'm looking for. I've got my opinions, and uh, you know, um, but we need to speak in relationship to people's perspectives before we can ever expect them to come to church. We need to actually love the people around us. You know, I, 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 I've been reading a book that, that maybe a sermon series for the next, next year called Not Like Me by, by Eric Bryant. He's a Baptist preacher down in, in Texas, in the Austin area. And he, he talks about engaging your neighbors. And I think about the fact that, okay, I, my neighbor to my right, I know him, I talk to him. Um, I, my neighbor across the street, I know. But I'll confess that we've got a neighbor also across the street. I don't know the names. My wife does because she's nice. You know what I mean? I don't know the names. I don't know their names. You know, we don't know the people around us, most of us. Most of you are likely to have neighbors moving close to the that sleep like a hundred feet away and you don't know who they are. Well, maybe you're better people than I am, but, but you know, many of us don't even know our neighbors. Much less love them. It annoys me. Oh, this could be on the internet, so <laughs> it kind of annoys me that a certain neighbor we keep in their car and swale for like three months. You know, that's the type of stuff I notice. But do I actually care? I don't know. That's, a, that's, that's where God is challenging me. So what I want to do is I want to examine this whole idea of being before that. And I want to acknowledge some things. I'm going to, I'm going to go through this next part kind of quickly. Um, but belief right now in truth, and this is part of getting into the language. You know, we talk about things as though I, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. And most of you amen that, and we you know, I can preach the choir, and, and we feel good that we leave here. But our culture increasingly doesn't believe in truth for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, modern society believes in truth. How many of you have heard the term postmodern? Okay. Some of, some of you have. Um, this is about a 20-year-old term. Um, the 
20th century is marked by what we would call modern culture. Modern culture is highly scientific, um, highly um, structured around you, you explore, you discern, you discover truth, and then that is the end of the story. Postmodern culture, um, in, in this, I could go into, like that could be a whole series of lectures just by itself. Postmodern culture, in many ways, began to develop in response to um, the crisis of faith we had in our government and in public institutions beginning in the 70s. Watergate, Iran Contra, you know, Whitewater. I mean, it's like every president, it seems like they do something really awful, and then we lose more and more faith. You know, Congress, the approval rates are like one third of one percent or something really low. You know, there's a one guy somewhere in Nevada who says, yeah, I, 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 I trust Congress, and the rest of us can't stand it. And so we've moved in this thing where we don't necessarily believe in truth anymore. And, and so that's called postmodern society. And I'm not going to give you the, the, the whole, like I said, the whole breakdown of what postmodern culture is. But we live in a society nowadays where people don't necessarily believe in truth. And the first time I really saw this up close was teaching confirmation about 12, 13 years ago. It was at Church of Cross where we had a ton of kids, like 100 kids in confirmation. And I'm talking to a seventh grader. And seventh graders are smart alecks. Anyway, they're just being in seventh grade, everything you say is challenging to the person saying to. But there's a young woman, young girl, who we were talking about truth, and she said, Well, I don't believe in truth. I think whatever you believe is fine as long as you really believe it. I said, Well, clearly some things are true, right? And she said, No. And I said, So if I get up in a chair and I touch the ceiling, it will move. No, it's only if you believe it. And I got up on I, I, I got up on a chair and I pushed on the ceiling top, which as I predicted, moved. My hand didn't go through it, I don't have Jedi powers. It moved, and I was able to move the ceiling top. And she still wouldn't acknowledge, well, I just think what if you believe it's fine as long as you believe it? That's our culture. Some of you may scoff at it, like I do. I don't get it. I didn't get this young woman, but you know what? She is in the majority. Among our age group. And we can we can sit here and say, that's stupid, that's dumb, I can't believe people think that. Or we can love them enough to say, you know, I see that you're very religious, like Paul did in Athens. But let me tell you about God. Because there are some churches doing incredible things, bring people to have particular worldviews to faith in Jesus Christ. So for Christians, we need to move beyond because of arguments. Many of you are like me. If it's in here, it's true. I believe that. 110%. Because the Bible tells me so is a really good defense. If you tell me, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? And I say, because the Bible tells me so, guess what? I'm right, you're wrong, end of story. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just if, 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 you, if you find your life out of conformity with what this says, it isn't this book. It's you. And I find myself all the time out of conformity where I'm less loving or less humble or less whatever. And the problem is not scripture as much as sometimes we'd like it to be. It's me. But guess what? My neighbors don't believe that. And that's not a great way to tell them about Jesus. Why do you believe that? Because the Bible tells me so. Why don't believe the Bible? And that becomes like a mic drop argument. They don't believe it. So what do I have to say at that point? So I have to learn the language if I care about them. If I don't, I can just say, well, that's fine. We'll go to church on Sunday and we'll be a club of holy rollers. We'll do a holy roller thing. And I got my Bible and I know this. I know, friends, this is the evening and the word of God. I believe that. Where I'm in variance with Scripture, the problem is me, it's not Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean every interpretation is correct. You can take things out of context. I get that. You can take a lot of things out of context. So, the Bible says this. The Bible, you know, maybe at one point, Paul tells his followers to. You know, I forget which town it was in, but grab my, my scroll and my cloak. Oh, we go to the city and say, okay, folks, we got to find it. You know, the Bible tells me, the Bible tells us to find his scroll and cloak, so go. Okay, so you still take it in context. But our neighbors don't necessarily believe that. So how do we engage them? We begin by, by talking about truth. And this debate over truth is nothing new. I think in many ways history is cyclical. You know, Jesus, in talking to Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18, very famously, you know, when Jesus proclaimed that he was the truth, uh, Pontius Pilate said, it's truth. So this is nothing new. What goes around comes around, 
In our society, we go, we be up, we flow, we go in circles, however you want to diagram it. So this is nothing new. That means that the challenges of our time are unique. The world isn't going to end tomorrow unless God says so. And if he does, cool. Get, go be with Jesus. But short of that, the world does not end because we elect a Democrat or Republican or Independent or whatever. Because here's the deal. We're one country among many. Christianity has been around for 2,000 years. The United States has been around for about 250. The world is not going to end for that reason. But individual worlds will end if we don't speak truth. What is truth? I'm just about to say. So let's, let's talk about that. I want to begin with the standard for truth. And here's where we're going to get kind of academic. And by the way, I'm going to go on. And if you don't like that, we'll leave it at 11. You know? I'm serious. I mean, if you've got somewhere to go, if you want to go good, but I'm going to go probably 10 minutes long. Um, and I'm going to be academic for, for, for a few minutes. Okay? How do we decide if something is true? And this was a chart I went through in class. It was interesting. Um, there's a scale that um, Dr. Clark, our professor, uh, I, don't, I don't know if he put it together, but, but he gave us a scale. On one hand, you have hard fideism. Fideism means you take things by faith. Everything's by faith. I don't need any proof. It's just faith. In fact, proof might be of the devil. I don't want any proof because that's going to be harmful to have any evidence because if I start to accept that evidence is helpful, now I've taken away from faith and I don't want to hear the evidence. For example, all you Mormons out there, the Book of Mormon is written about fictitious cities and fictitious places um, and fictitious people that have no grounding in history. And when I was at the, 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 the whole tabernacle, or the, the convention center complex in Salt Lake City, and they do the little tour and they give you their little thing, I, I was politely debating with an older gentleman standing, you know, at one of the things, and, and I asked him, so you guys think that the Jews ended up in North America, some of them, or not the Jews, some of the Israelites ended up in North America. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And which language did they speak? Well, they spoke Reformed Egyptian. Now, let me take a time. That doesn't exist. That, that, there's no such thing as Reformed Egyptian. Just so you know, there's no historical record of a Reformed Egyptian ever existing, much less being in North America. And the idea that, that hundreds of years after, the, hundreds and hundreds of years, after they left Egypt, 700 years to be exact, they would be speaking Egyptian when we know for a fact they spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. So why they would end up in North America and be speaking Egyptian is crazy talk. Not to mention, you can go to the pyramids in Mexico. I've been there in Chichen Itza. There are no hieroglyphics. There was no Egyptian. They didn't speak it. They didn't end up here. It's not real. But if you get a little missionary, they'll say, well, it's not about evidence. You just need to pray and you feel a, a, a warm, tingling feeling. That's what they call the Holy Spirit. It must be true. That's an example of hard fideism. You can believe it. It doesn't matter if there's any evidence. In fact, if there's evidence, that evidence will, will, will cause you to trust evidence. You don't find evidence, so evidence is bad. Soft fideism says, well, it's helpful, but you really don't need it. Soft rationalism, rationalism on the other hand, says one of the ways you discern truth is through the rational minds that God gave us. Because these are all perspectives that the various Christian philosophers have held. So let's say, you know, God gives a mind, use it. And so rationalism, um, there's, there's soft and there's hard. Hard rationalism says, you need 100% proof. 100%. Or it's not true. You better not believe it. Now there are people like this, and we call them paranoid. Right? A paranoid person demands 100% truth before they believe something. How do you know your wife isn't cheating? Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, and then they install cameras and GPS things, and they can take nothing by faith because it has to be 100%. I'm kind of this way when I fly. I've shared with you guys many times. I'm not afraid of flying, I'm afraid of creation. There's a big difference. I like flying, flying is fun. <laughs> Crashing, I imagine, would be not so fun. I like fun things. I don't like things that end with me dying. Screaming is I plummet from 30,000 feet. So I like flying. I don't like the idea of crashing. And so flying back, I flew back a day early from the conference, a Lutheran conference out in Denver. And I knew 
the flight from Atlanta to Daytona Beach would probably be kind of rough because we already had the outer bands of Hurricane Matthew coming in. And so I'm sitting there, and the flight was less than full, which never happens at Delta. And a pilot comes, I've got open seats after everybody sat, and there's a pilot comes and says, can I sit, is this seat open, can I sit here? And of course, <clears throat> I, I have the, the spiritual gift of sarcasm, and so I said, absolutely, but I don't think you can find a plane from there. <laughs> you know, I'm sure he's never heard that before. You know, and the guy shot, but I said, I don't use you, you're, you're, you're not, I, I don't have fun. But I thought, score, I have a pilot next to me. Because I don't like when we start doing the bouncy, bouncy thing. And I don't know, or are we going to die, or is this just bouncy, bouncy? Because I like roller coasters. If we're just doing bouncy, bouncy, that's fine. If we're about to plummet to our death, I would like to know. So I can pray with people and be like the pastor of the airplane or whatever I would do. I probably would cry. But um, and it was cool because he sat next to me and I was asking him all kinds of questions. And he's the type of person that loves to answer questions. And he actually took out his tablet and showed how they avoid turbulence now. And he was really cool made no turbulence on flight. And, you know, they navigate around the different storm clouds. It was really cool watching it in real time. Um, and, and, and so, you know, if you need 100% proof, you are going to be an unhappy, paranoid, just delusional person. And so the argument um, that, that I'm going to make is that we, we fall under something called soft rationalism. Listen, there are some things you have to take by faith. I don't know anything for 100%. I cannot prove to you right now that I'm not in the matrix and you're all a computer simulation. I cannot prove that. I'm fairly certain, though. I'm about 99.9% .9 certain that's not true. I can't prove it. But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, okay? And so we fall under what we call soft rationalism. Evidence is, is helpful. I love the fact that when it comes to the New Testament, I can go to Philippi. I can tell you, like I did earlier, Lydia was baptized there. She was a real person. And Jesus, I can go to Jerusalem and say, he was crucified there, and the temple was there. These are real places and real people. There is evidence. We believe by faith, but you know what? There's evidence. That's a beautiful thing. And so our standard for truth is that we acknowledge that yes, you do need evidence. There's some things you have to take by faith. But it's kind of like in a, in, you know, in a court of law. You never prove anything 100%. But you believe in a reasonable doubt. Okay? And it's not, that's not a perfect correlation, but soft rationalism acknowledges um, that, that, that we, we do want some semblance of, of evidence and truth. And by the way, I'll take a time out. I wish I had heard this when I was the old age of point of younger people, Smith kids, um, all the younger people, because you're the ones. I, I'm, I'm going to be retired like relatively soon. I've realized like 25 years is a really short amount of time. <laughs> Good luck, because it's going to get worse. Okay, so we can sit back and we're like seven years old. I think you guys do this. And I can judge your worship style, and I can laugh at you and say, I am so bad, I don't have to evangelize now. Except I will. You, you never grow out of it. But I, I, I do wish I had taught this when I was younger. Because my generation would question her. So our goal is to move people you know, from that point of disbelief to the point of belief. And one of the ways we would talk about it, and I'll just talk about the slide real quick, and I'm going I'm to kind of revisit this over the next few weeks, is moving people, if you picture a river, this is like a river where First, we're talking about whether or not there's truth. Is there truth? Is truth noble? Um, does God exist? What is the character of God? Is he a good God? Is he a mean God? Does he care about you? Can you have a relationship with him? And they move people to faith in Jesus Christ, which we're going to do over the next three weeks. We're going to talk about those. And, you know, we have questions. What about people who are in violence? A lot of people will ask me about that. But, I mean, it's, it's not that I'm against Jesus, but you Christians have done such horrible things. How can it possibly be true? Well, we need to own that. We, we need to talk about it. We need to wrestle with that. Questions of, okay, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, what about the kid in rural Afghanistan who's never heard of Jesus? Do we need to be able to address those things, even if we don't have the answers? To acknowledge those are, those are real questions. So why don't we move people to, to a point of faith? So what is the argument then for truth? Okay, today we're going to, we're going to talk about truth. Now, I want to define first and then um, talk about some of the arguments for truth. Truth is undefined as statements of fact and description that accurately reflect real world knowledge. What is actual? What is truth? Well, conscious pilot is, it, it is what is really. What is really? What is actuality? Because the thing is, at the end of the day, there, there is a reality somewhere. 
if I was actually living in the matrix right now, that, that's real. I mean, it's not, it's not what I mean, I know it, but that's actually real. So there is a truth. There is a reality. But knowledge is a person's awareness then, your apprehension or possession of what is true. So we're not just talking about truth, we're talking about the knowledge of the truth. And I want to kind of, kind of unpack that um, for the next couple of minutes and then we're going to tie it together and finish for today. So what are the arguments for truth existing? Well, first of all, the way we live. We live as though we acknowledge things to be true. We live as though we acknowledge things to be true. You get in your car, you drive to Publix, because you looked on a website and you know that's something from 8 a.m. to whatever, 10 p.m. That, that's, that's, that's truth. You believe that to be true. Now, how crazy would it be if my wife said to me, let's go to Publix to get dinner, and I said, I don't believe it exists. I don't see it. Well, but you've been there before. I don't see it now. Well, let's just go. Really? Waste the gas? How do I know if there is a Publix? How do I know it's open? Well, the website, I don't care about the website, is probably a globalist lizard conspiracy or something. You know, they're trying to get me to believe that there is a Publix, and the aliens are, like, I don't believe there's a Publix. And I don't believe some website of dubious character and content. We live as though things are true, right? We get in cars, we fly airplanes, we go to schools. We may not agree with everything, but we do acknowledge. Because you can't live your life. This argument that there's not truth is defined by the way we live every single time we get up in the morning. And the people who live as though there is no truth end up with like aluminum foil hats sitting in their houses with their guns, you know, scared of the postman. Do you follow me? Now, we may argue about whether or not A or B is true, but the way we live acknowledges that some things must be true. We know by experience, and don't make fun of us, but human intelligence exists. When we can laugh, well, we went to Walmart yesterday, and I don't think there's any. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, right now, I'm standing here, and I am communicating to you. Does that blow your mind? That should blow your mind. I am standing here, and there are some people that claim that this came from nothing, it just happened. And yet I am here, and thoughts are going from my head, along neurons, to my mouth, and I'm communicating to you, and you are receiving the message, and you are processing it. That should blow your mind. We experience human intelligence, paintings, freeways, architecture, landscaping. Somebody thought of this. And they put their pen to paper and imagine had somebody else built this. We experience human intelligence. So don't tell me things aren't true. And we see around us, even absent humanity, we see a rational, ordered universe. I'm not looking at that. But it's funny study the, the different mathematical formulas that govern our, our universe. And when we step back inside, things have a chance. Really? That takes a lot of faith. Doesn't make logic, though. And we experience it without the truth. And again, I'm not going to break this down much. But we have desires for certain things. Many of you are here in the church, because at some point, you just want to figure it out. I want to figure out what's true and what's not true. And we have a desire for things that exist. And how strange would it be if, in fact, we're just some random mutation that we exist because we do. How strange would it be that a whole six billion of us that have the concept of truth and there be no such thing? I, I think that the desire for truth is, is one of the arguments for truth. And none of these is conclusive, but the bigger point is that we live as though things are true. So then what about knowledge and what about forming beliefs? Well, in this form, I'll include all this talk about briefly. We perform knowledge through authority. I trust scripture. Now your neighbor may not, but they trust somebody. They trust something. Whether it's the internet or their school teacher or whatever, there are authorities they trust. We trust our experience. I, I've told the story over and over again of the woman in Iraq that, that came to faith for seeing Jesus. Um, that's not, she's not the only one. There are some people that their faith is by experience. And we all have different experiences, we all have different faith experiences. 
Um, we, we learn things and we form beliefs based on perception. I look around, how about you? But I look around and, and my senses tell me that data I take in tells me somebody did this. We're not here by mistake. There, 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 there's something more. And I haven't gotten a guy yet. I just want to talk about truth. And then I, I, I make inferences. I, I, I logically put together what people say, my experiences, my senses, I put all together and I say, yeah, these are true. There's truth out there. I, I, I want to find it. But there's truth out there. And so why we're doing this, and I, I, I cannot emphasize that last part enough, if you want to have a deep faith, ask questions. If you want to have a deep faith, go to scriptures and say, why did God kill a great Jericho? Or why did he command his wife to kill a great Jericho? You may not get the answer, but that type of faith, a faith that interacts with the world, we've never been, Christians have never been isolated in a bubble where we say, oh, we don't want to hear it, don't want to hear it, don't want to hear it. Paul went down and he reasoned with the Epicureans and Stoics. Ask questions. Still curiosity. Why? For these two reasons. Our world might not accept truth, and they might order their lives around the wrong priorities. And my question is this. Do you love your neighbor? Do you care about them? Do you care about your neighbor? I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on that. I'm just going to ask, do you care about your neighbor? If we want to tell them, we will. Do you care about the people around you? Maybe you don't. And you're happy going to church and putting your money in the offering plate and singing a couple songs and hearing a nice message that should end up, we should be out here by 11 o'clock and we're not today, but, you know, Chris is talking about, talk, Chris is talking. Do you care about your neighbor? Maybe you not. Because if you do, you have a mission. Not me and Rusty, well, Rusty and I also. You do. It's your job. And we're going we're to talk about that next few weeks. I want to empower you to so love the world that you speak the language. To so love the world that you care enough to, to, to speak to them. And I don't want, I don't bow with thumbs. I don't want you to hit people over the head. I don't want you, you know, going out and saying, well, I'm right, you're wrong, <laughs> you know. But do you love your neighbors? Because if you do, you'll say something. You'll tell them. You'll speak truth. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to pray, but I'm going to pass around the board. And I, nobody has to sign. This is not like a, I don't care if people do or don't sign, but I've said a lot, this is an extra long sermon, and it's going to be extra long to watch for those of you online. Um, but I'm going to, if, if you want to sit and talk about some of these issues, or during the sermon series, I'm going to just going to collect if anybody does. Um, but we'll see a time that most people can meet, or we will a couple of meetings. Um, and if we don't, that's fine. But if this is something you'd like to unpack further this week, you don't have to be there a week if you to make it this week, you can't make it next week, that's fine. I'm going to pass this around in an offering. And um, so just when it gets to the end of the section, just make sure everybody gets it. And, um, and we're going to talk. Next week, we're going to have more about the existence of God. I've made the argument that truth exists. I hope that makes it to this point. Yeah. So next week, we're going to talk specifically about why we believe in God. And how do we show it all around us? So let's pray. Father, thank you so much. That you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to interpret all. We take in a world around us. And you know, Lord, in, in spite of um, what we may think or feel, especially when we get on social media and we listen to people that we this world is pretty bad. People are hurting, absolutely, people are hurting. And there are good choices and there are bad choices, and it's right and wrong. But help us not to see our neighbors as the enemy. That is probably better than is dearly beloved by you, no matter how much we can have. So remind us of that the people are so beloved by you. And help us to give us a language to share that love, that truth, that witness. To call the world to repentance and a change of heart, a change of ways, to follow you. Empower us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. All that's going to say. Amen. Let's say